Great. So, hello everyone. It's great to be here in React India. It's my first time here and uh, I can't complain about anything. I'm loving everything so far. Yeah, and as they said, I'm here to talk about deep diving on concurrent React. I'm pretty sure many of you watched Tisha's talk earlier today and uh, really loved it. I did love it as well and that's even harder to follow up on that. But let me try it. So this is me, I'm Mateus, as you can find me as Y the Combinator literally everywhere. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Medallia and I also mentor people on front end at Tech Labs. Before we start, I do have a couple of disclaimers. So the first one is we're going to be talking about React and um, the source code of React, it changes a lot over time and some things are complicated to read and etc. So some of the thoughts you're going to see here are speculations. And the second thing is uh, sometimes it might sound a lot of information. So if you ever feel lost, look for this emoji, then it means we can have further discussions uh, about the topic after the session. So a little bit of why we're here and the why's behind of the session. So a couple months ago, I had uh, my last session about React, and uh, it was uh, called Inside Fibers. And we got to talk a lot of interesting stuff that I love, like fibers, cool routines, uh, generators in JavaScript, and uh, algebraic effects. But at the same time, I felt like I needed to talk about other stuff. I wanted to talk more about Virtual Dawn, that is one of the key things behind React. I also wanted to talk more about concurrency and parallelism. And we always should talk about concurrent React, right? And last but not least, measurement. So we always hear a lot about concurrent React, but we don't talk a lot about how to measure that or when it's actually necessary or not. So let's start from the beginning. So if we were to build a new library, just like React, Angular, etc., which ways we could go, right? So we could work with down reconciliation. That's, for example, what Angular, Polymer, Blitz, HTML, that's what they do. Uh, we have Virtual DOM that we know very well from React, from uh, Vue, or from Inferno, or many others within this ecosystem. And we have also reactivity. That is the thing that everyone is talking about. So it's, we had Svelte, and then we now have Solid, that's really popular. And a couple of years ago, we even had Knockout doing reactive approaches. Focusing a bit on Virtual DOM, so React, Vue, and Inferno. Um, I don't know if you have managed to watch, but there's this session by Pete Hunt. He used to be core team of React. And uh, this session was like almost a decade ago. And uh, there's many interesting stuff, but one of them is he said that with React, we can build applications without even thinking about performance because the default state is fast. And this was back in 2013, and it actually made sense. It's not that he was wrong, but the point is, back to Virtual Dawn. We know that uh, Virtual Dawn works by generating a virtual tree, and then you diff against the previous iteration, and once you have this diff, you patch the Dawn updates. And we use a lot of immutability and referential equality uh, to optimize this whole process, because in the, in the end, we are still doing trees. But this results in a lot of cloning, and because you have a lot of cloning, you have a lot of memory allocation. And that's not the only thing. Throughout the history of React, we've seen some perf issues, and that's why we have perf mitigators. So when we were doing classes, we first had shoot component update and pure component. I'm pretty sure some of you remember that, right? And then we had function components, and we had react.memo that was pretty much the same thing, but for this. And then, in the age of hooks, we had use memo and use callback. And then, with the new concurrent features and etc., we got new hooks. So we got use transition, use deferred value. We got also suspense, 
as we saw in Tisha stocks, and we got many other stuff. So these mitigators, they kind of have a reason. And the reason is React doesn't actually know what's, uh, it doesn't have an idea of the flow of the values through our app. And that's why we can say it's not reactive. And that's pretty ironically, and uh, it's actually been kind of a joke in the community for a couple of years now. And it's pretty much in this scenario that guys like uh, Svelte and Solid came. And concurrence, it's, uh, reactivity itself has a lot of interesting ideas, and I love it, but we are here for React and Virtual Dawn, right? Uh, and we can see nowadays is that for most of the scenarios, vir Virtual Dawn has been optimized well enough and it doesn't necessarily have to be React. We don't see a lot of people complaining about performance in Inferno or how Virtual Dawn increases the bundle size of a Preact app. And there are libraries that they do Virtual Dawn that can get even smaller reduced results like Hyper App. So the thing about Virtual Dawn is it's just one of the approaches we have to build a UI library. And it has drawbacks, but it has like the good things, and that's never a true or false question. And the reason why I'm saying that is because understanding the key takeaways from Virtual Dawn is really helpful for us to see where concurrent React fits in. So this brings the question, why do we even bother discussing that? Why do we even care? So if I had to go with one word, performance, so we are very used to seeing like uh, especially runtime responsiveness and smoothness associated to concurrent React. So we talk a lot about how it helps like with the flow, with the good user interactions and maintaining a good frame rate and etc. But the thing is concurrent React can help you in four different aspects of your app and that's why we're here today. And I'd love to start with the classics. So in this very simple example, I do have some input fields, and I have links, uh, I have like tasks, checkbox, and etc. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to virtually block the main thread. And because it's blocked and the browser is single threaded, um, because it's blocked and the browser is single threaded, uh, we have bad experience. And this is called mostly because of long tasks. These uh, red signs that we see every time uh, we are inspecting that kind of thing. And even though this was a virtual example, uh, it happens a lot out there. And that's because of that that we have metrics like first input delay and many others to track that. Because these things are happening in production for real users in real apps. And there are even studies about that. So there's this one from the last year, for example, that they showed that uh, the slow first input delay happens seven times more on mobile devices. And um, it's even worse when you get to visualize that. So you see how it's like for desktop, and then you see the huge yellow and red parts of the chart for mobile users. And of course, this does bring business outcomes. So the first thing is long tasks, they delay the time to interactive. But not only that, uh, because of this, the overall conversion rates decrease. And in mobile, these long tasks, they are 12 times longer. So they're even worse. And uh, it's terrible because old devices could be spending half of the time they have in their low time on long tasks. And if it sounds like really bad, it's even worse when you see a chart of how this affects your business. So that's why we bother discussing concurrent React. And um, to move on with this session, I'd love to, help, to have the help of you. So I have this one question. By watching the previous talk and from everything you heard about Concurrent React now, if you had to summarize in one word or one expression, what would be your take? For example, if I had to summarize fibers in one expression, that would be units of work. So to help me uh, with this question, uh, I have this QR code, uh, which I would love to have you scanning and telling me your answers and wait for it. I got a timer here, so please allow rush. And to, say, to show you how much I would appreciate to have your help to answer me this, um, 
the first three people who answer that, I'm going to be giving discount codes for React Brussels. And everyone else, I got tons of stickers over there. So I really hope I can buy you stickers. I could be. <laughs> so yeah, uh, let's give it like another 30 seconds. Uh, I really hope this is working out for you, the QR code. Yeah. One word, one expression, concurrent React. Yep. It's funny how a minute takes long when you're not saying a lot of stuff, so I'm kind of trying to. OK, uh, eight, seven, six. Uh, I don't see anyone with the phones. Let's skip it. So before we get to an answer, let's talk about the main thread. <laughs> so to talk about the main thread, we've got to talk about units, or, or about tasks first. So what do we know about a task is it's a unit of, worker, of work that the browser does to render a single frame. And this includes all the five steps of doing JavaScript, the layouts and uh, styles and layout, and then paint and composite phases. And this is like what we usually see when we are understanding we are studying a browser under the hood. Uh, and basically, a long task, as you might imagine, uh, it's a task that takes more than 50 milliseconds because that's when input starts to feel delayed. And this is not a magic number. This is based on a model called Rail. This is a user-centric model. And the other bad thing about long tasks is that not only they take long, as the name suggests, but they also block other tasks. So I guess one of the questions we should be asking is how to avoid blocking the main thread. So for this, we got a couple task running strategies. So we have parallelism, that is when we have multiple threads. So we have multiple tasks at the same times in different CPU cores. Uh, we also have concurrency. So we have only one thread, but we are able to quickly switch between these tasks so that it feels concurrent. And then we have scheduling. That is, when we have concurrency, but we have a tool called a scheduler on top of that, assigning different priorities to different tasks. So it's better if we visualize that. So let's assume we have tasks A, B, C, D. Uh, if we're doing parallelism, we could split them like that, two per thread. Uh, in concurrency, they would look like this. And scheduling, pretty much the same, but you're going to see that some of them got higher priorities than the others. So to talk about concurrent React, it's good that we talk about parallelism first. And parallelism in the browser comes as workers. So workers, they're very different from threads in C++ or Java, if we are used to them. And this happens because we don't have access to variables or any code, actually, from the page that created them, and vice versa. Uh, oops. And because of that, data exchange happens via message passing. So if, if, if you've done workers before, you know what I'm talking about. And by the way, tomorrow is going to be a great talk about workers. Uh, but one of the things they have is they don't have access to the DOM. And because of that, making UI updates is, is almost impossible. And the uh, apps that want to use workers, they kind of have to adapt their architecture to this, mo to this model so that they can kind of overcome the limitations of workers. Another thing is we have two models for doing workers. Uh, we have actors that we might have heard from other ecosystems like Olang and Elixir, and we have shared memory. So basically, uh, act actors, they may run on a separate or on a different thread. And each actor fully owns the data it is operating on. Actors, they can also, not also, but they can only send and receive messages. And if we were to talk about a browser, it's like the main thread we have is the actor that fully owns the DOM and the UI. Uh, the, the other thing about actors is every message we send, it needs to be copied so that it works. So if you've done workers, you know that. And we end up having to balance, OK, we want to move code to a worker. Uh, so that we can optimize and offload the main thread. But at the same time, we have this communication overhead. And also, we have to handle, for example, if that worker is not busy handling something else that it got from somewhere else. And the last thing is that post message, that is the method we have, is a fire and forget mechanism. So 
there's no no thing out of the box that allows you to, for example, track requests and response and if something failed, for example. The other thing is the shared memory. So in the browser, it happens with the shared array buffer that is the only dedicated type we have for that. And basically, that's a linear chunk of memory that we can manipulate that with these two guys, typed arrays and data views. And the amazing thing is, if you send one of these via post message, the other end is going to get a handle to the exact same part of the memory. So that's cool. But um, we are in the browser. We are in a place where most of the APIs were built with no concurrency in mind, no concurrent access to the objects. And if you've done concurrency in other ecosystems, you know that this is critical. So you end up having to build your own mutexes and other data structures that are prepared for handling that kind of thing. Not only that, uh, we don't have a direct way of doing arrays, objects, and the things we are used to. All we have is a series of bytes that we have to build abstractions on top of them. Last but not least, you might be thinking, OK, what about WebAssembly? So oops, what about WebAssembly? So that's a pretty good case where we have workers and the shared memory, uh, shared array buffers. Uh, and we get a threading model similar to what we would have in C++, for example. And to be honest, nowadays I would say that's the best experience for a shared memory model. But it's usually faster than JS when you stay within WASM. But the first moment you got to do something that has to do with updating the DOM or manipulating something in the main thread and things like that, then you start realizing that it's not as fast as you expect it to. And there are many talks and benchmarks about that, by the way, out there. So we come to realize that JavaScript is actually faster at doing DOM rendering in a lot of times. And the high-level libraries you have, like React, Svelte, whatever, uh, sometimes, for some scenarios, they can be faster than the fastest low-level abstractions in the walls. And and last but not least, you still don't have the benefits and comfort of writing JavaScript. Before we move forward, it is important to highlight that there's a lot of work happening on that to improve the, the, all of these aspects I mentioned. So we have the Atomics type uh, that's moving fast. Uh, we have open source libraries like Buffer, Bake, the Object. We have Comlink uh, by Google Chrome that is like a really good abstraction on top of workers that makes using workers really smooth. And we even have Worker done also by Google that's also a way of making UI changes from inside a worker that makes it possible. So to wrap up, I'm sorry you were taking a picture. <laughs> to wrap up, uh, workers are really good for data processing or when you have to crunch numbers and do heavy stuff with that. But they end up being hard when you got to do UI related stuff. And that's harder than adjusting the, what you got to do for a scheduler. And this takes us to, to, that, uh, to the other two things we had. And this takes us back to the question uh, I asked in the beginning. So I really hope this is going to work. Uh, and I really hope I'll be able to fetch your answers. Um, but if I'm not, that's weird. I can see them on my screen. Uh, I don't know why it's not handling here. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, the first word was fast. Uh, and then we had parallel response and suspense. But the winner was fast. Uh, I'm going to present to you my take on that. So if I had to go with one word, that would be scheduling. So, and to talk about scheduling in React, uh, I have this piece of code. So we have uh, a function that's called resourceful operation. I hope the code is not too small. And this is basically to mimic any CPU bound operation. And in this scenario, I'm iterating up to a million. And then in my React component, I'm using this function. And you can see that as I start typing on the right, uh, it takes me like quite some time to get it rendered on the left. And uh, then it starts to getting laggy and laggy, and uh, then Chrome stops working. So that's, that's really poor user experience. And uh, we might think, how can we prove that? So to start with that, um, who here has seen Redux Saga or ever worked with that. Whoa, that's pretty. 
So you all know that uh, it was one of the most popular, maybe it still is one of the most popular Redux middlewares a couple years ago. And there's one of the things I love about there is how they use generator functions uh, to do concurrency, parallelism, and handle cancellation, race conditions, and etc. So getting some inspiration from Saga, uh, this is the original code we had. Let's change it a bit. And what we change it is now our have a function is a generator, and we are yielding execution back to ma the main thread right in the beginning. And we have this scheduler object, and uh, we are doing some concurrent tasks with this scheduler object. We're going to talk about it in a minute. So let's see the results. So you can see that first it is suspense ready. So the user is never in the dark. They can see that there is some heavy operation going on. And the second thing is the input is never janky. So I can type, 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 and it's still responsive. And I don't have the long tasks are not making the user experience bad anymore. And uh, this is the full code for that scheduler we talked about. And the most important part is this perform unit of work section where basically we are switching on three different states, idle, pending, and done. And the key things we are using is first we are throwing promises just like Tejas was doing it earlier today. And we are using our, our, the next method from our iterator to do that. So it might sound a lot like we just used transitioned. Uh, and uh, if we get back to the original code, and we change that, yeah, this could be a transition. So yes, we just did use transition, but with the own scheduler, we built in 40 lines using generators. So talking about scheduling in React, uh, now that we know there's no parallelism, there's no workers, was or anything like that, uh, what we ha do have, though, is this multitasking model that's cooperative. And we have a single interruptible rendering thread. And because of that, rendering can be interleaved with other browser tasks, including React renders. Uh, and because of that, an update can happen in the background without blocking uh, what's going to happen, the, the, the response to the new input, for example, and then React is able to resume the execution. So to visualize, it's like that. So we had the original render task. Then I started typing, so that was my user input. And the browser has to handle in the input field what I'm typing. So that was the higher priority thing. And then after I stop typing, React can resume the original render task. And there are a few key things about that. And one of them is that it yields execution back to the main thread after five milliseconds. And I know it sounds, again, a lot like a magic number, just like those we use in CSS to make things work. But the key thing is that it's smaller than a single frame, even when you are in 120 FPS devices. So that's what makes that in practice rendering is interruptible. Uh, another amazing thing about the source of that is are the priority levels. So inside the scheduler of React, we're going to see th these five different priority levels. And uh, the same thing we see in the scheduler, we see throughout the rest of the framework. So we see them inside React Reconciler. We see them inside React Done and other React renderers. And we see them inside the dev tools, for example. So that's, that's imp how important priorities in scheduling are. And basically, these different levels, they range from immediate to idle. And uh, they have different timeouts, as you can see. And this basically tells React when it has to do something, ranging from, OK, this needs to happen like right now, to, OK, do it whenever you can. And another amazing thing that's also mind-blowing are render lanes. So they're an abstraction built around bit masks. So basically, one lane equals to one bit in a bit mask. And each updating React is associated to one of those render lanes. And one render, as opposed to an update, can be associated to one or more lanes. And as you might imagine, uh, updates in the same render lane happen are batched together. Updates in different lanes are batched separately. And uh, first, this abstraction gives us 31 levels of granularity, because that's what we have in a bit mask. But the other tricky thing, or the good thing, is that it allows us to choose whether to render 
multiple transitions in a single batch or to render them independently. So that's the magic under the hood of Concurrent React. And this whole thing reduces the overhead of multiple operations, like multiple layout passes, multiple recalculations of style, and multiple paints to the browser. And I myself, when I figured out about the different priorities and the different lanes and etc., I was like this, like really mind blowing. But there's this session uh, by Kites, and it's called "But You're Not Facebook." So. We are not Facebook. We are not writing schedulers on a daily basis. We are just writing components, or we are writing divs enabled by DevOps guys. So how do we benefit from these in our everyday projects, from the scheduler, from all of these things? And this takes us to scheduling in React for the rest of us. So there are a couple scenarios that I see that this can be really helpful. So the first one, and maybe the most obvious one, is when we have to handle large sets of data. So most of the examples we see out there, and even the example I did in the beginning was really non-practical, because we're not iterating up to a million in our components. Uh, we are not trying to find prime numbers. We are not trying to run some heavy crack password algorithm or draw frog dolls. But we, what we usually do though is we usually render many data points on a dashboard. We usually try to render things on a canvas and we don't have off-screen canvas because it's not available in all of the browsers. And we usually have to process some data on the front end. So one good example for that would be, uh, so this is a dashboard that basically calculates the number of people who visited uh, some app uh, each day. And you can see that I, can, I should be able to filter by data. But the thing is, um, it's really lagging a bit. It's not like the first example, like that was almost crashing my Chrome. But still, the animation is janky, and the response to the user is not immediately. And this is the whole code for that. So we, not, not magic. Uh, use a state uh, and use a fact to populate some data. And then we pass that to the dashboard component. Let's see what happens if we just change that to a transition. So oop, in the very beginning, so you can see that I can move. And uh, I'm filtering data. The records are still changing after I've done that. But the animation is smooth all the time. And there is no long task running in Chrome. There's no running task making any harm in a mobile device. And I myself, when I saw uh, transitions, I was like, I wish I could go back in time to some scenarios where I needed them. Uh, the first one was this app I was working where we had the maps, and we had 100,000 data points applied to that map. And uh, back then, uh, we used workers, Redux Saga, and some debouncing techniques to allow proper searching and filtering that data, but we could have used transitions. And also, this one was three years ago. I was, watching, uh, I was, I was developing this football game where users could chat at the same time. And there's an admin panel that you had thousands of users sending thousands of messages, and the admin should be able to search them, to query them, and that kind of stuff. And back then, we had to do virtualization and memoize basically everything. But actually, if we just had transitions, things could have been better. The second thing is tackling, tackling wasted renders. So just use sync external store hook. It's, um, who has heard of it? Oh, yeah, quite a few. So it's a quite simple one. It has three parameters, and it was also introduced in React 18. And actually, when it was out there, uh, there are a lot of posts like how you can use it to improve your uh, state uh, handling library or something like that. And there was even talks about that. And uh, even some libraries, like uh, Voltio, they switched to using that. And Redux, starting in V8, was also using that. So still, we think, how can we use that in our everyday projects? Uh, we are not maintainers of Redux. So we are using React Router here, right? So I guess many of us. So React Router has this use location hook. And it gives us information about the hash and the path name. But it's what we call as an over-returning hook. So even though my component only needs the path name, I'm still going to get the hash and other stuff, and vice versa. And the thing that impacts the performance is, you can see here, I'm clicking the components, and I'm changing the hash of the page. But the component using the path name is still re-rendering. 
So we could change that by using, instead of that one, using use history and use sync external store. And now we can kind of create our own selectors inside the history object. And with that, we can see the results. And now only the hash object is re-rendering as it is supposed to. So no re-renders in path name. The other thing are hydration improvements. So before React 18, we could only, uh, the whole process of hydration could only begin after the entire data was fetched and rendered. And because of the, that, users couldn't interact with the page until it was fully complete. And the bad thing is that parts of the app that loaded faster would have to wait for parts of the, lab, the app that were slower so that you could have the full hydration. With React 18 and concurrency, you can have uh, selective hydration and you can wrap your server-side rendered code with uh, suspense. And in this example, articles is going to be uh, streamed and it's going to start running comments and then comments is streamed after. So React won't wait for that component to load to continue streaming HTML for the rest of the page. And the, the great thing is when that one part of HTML becomes available, uh, it will be added to the same stream and it will become a script tag that's placed in the, the right place. So also because of concurrent React, uh, React is going to priorita prioritize hydrating the parts that the users interacted first before the rest. And in the whole result is components can become interactive faster. And because of that, you have better first input delay and better interaction to next page. That is also another really important metric. And uh, there are even case studies out there. Verso, for example, they use that to improve the performance of the next JS web page. Last one, profiler, oops, I'm always clicking the wrong one. Last one, profiler enhancements. So the new profiler for React 18, uh, they, uh, it allows you to inspect transitions. So that's really good because if some people are using transitions, but they don't have the right tools to profile them. So now you can profile them because we're not only writing code, we also need to debug it, right? And it has utilities, for example, to detect when there are some other parts of the code that are blocking your renders. And it even has warns to tell you, hey, this could be moved into a transition. So you have a long task here that's poor, that's making your experience poor, move that to a transition. So that's amazing. Um, it's not fair to talk about scheduling in React and not talk about scheduling on the web. So. On the web, uh, we might be thinking throughout the whole time, we have things for scheduling in the browser. So yeah, we have scheduling primitives. We have set timeout and set immediate. We have request animation frame and request idle callback. Probably some of you even used that in the past. And we have post message for workers that are, they are a way of scheduling. But we also have some problems on the web. And the first one is that everyone should be using the same scheduler. So. If React has their, its own scheduler, and then Angular, and then Svelte, and then some maps, for example, Google Maps, they have their own scheduler for the app. So everyone should be using the same scheduler, because if not, uh, if you have more than one schedulers, then you might end up with resource fighting. And that's something that you can even happen in your app if you, for example, poorly using your Redux sagas. So not only that, Everything should be interleaving with the browser work, like rendering, garbage collection for JavaScript, and etc. So it turns out that we do need better and more uniform primitives for scheduling in the web. Like the ones we have now, uh, sometimes they are unpredictable. They don't work in a co cooperated way, and etc. And people out there are aware of that. And that's why we have the prioritized task scheduling API that's being cooked up. Uh, and it's, def it's amazing. I would definitely recommend you to check it out. And it's supposed to be like a better solution for scheduling tasks. And the difference is it's integrated directly in the event loop. So it's going to be like native scheduling. And this allows you, as, the whole, as, as I'm making my point, this allows you to control and schedule tasks in a united and flexible way. And another amazing thing is that it's pretty aligned with the React core team. 
and with the core team of other frameworks like Polymer, with other teams at Google, and with the web standards community. Uh, there's an amazing talk about that by Jason and Shubi Panicker. Uh, I would recommend you to check it out as well. And to basically summarize this API, uh, these are my four favorite parts of the API. We have yield that as the name suggests, allow you to yield back to event loop. We have post tasks to control and prioritize tasks. We have wait and as input pending. Going quite briefly through them, so post task looks like this, and you can, for example, add delays and etc. and it's promise based. And you can come up with a lot of interesting scenarios where you define different priorities, like for example, whether it can be in the background or whether it's user blocking. And uh, because you have signals, you can change the priority or you can get information about that, you can abort some tasks and etc. As input pending basically allows you to stop doing something if the browser is processing input and you can even filter the kinds of inputs you're gonna listen for. And yield, uh, as the name suggests, allows you, it's a promise-based API that allows you to switch to yield back to the event loop. And you can even combine with as input pending, for example, because if it's not, then you can continue. And uh, there are many great stuff out there. Airbnb, for example, is using some of the a these APIs, the ones that are available to be used. Uh, Facebook was a huge contributor for uh, the is input pending one. And there are even libraries like Manfred scheduling that kind of mimic the yield spec, for example. So uh, people are already doing great stuff with that. So to recap scheduling, it, it is an alternative for responsive user interfaces. Uh, we have a web proposal that's on the way that's going to be like m a more united way and a more stabilized way to do scheduling. But in the meantime, we can solve a lot at the framework level or at the application level with concurrent React and its scheduler. And before we move forward, uh, it's always important to remember that there is no silver bullet. So sometimes code that you use too often can also generate cause some overhead, and this total overhead might have a inf bad influence in your app. So scheduler does, scheduling does have bad parts. So the whole process of detection and scheduling have an overhead. Also, scheduling is about splitting chunks of work and assigning priorities. And sometimes it's difficult to find the right ch amount of chunk that's going to fit all the devices because every device has different specs. Uh, also, partially complete interfaces can increase the cost of uh, layout and paint. And it can even result in issues like tearing. That is why we have uh, use sync external store and uh, in the end it's hard to find the right spot between performance and amount of blocking so and the the fact that uh, we have the no silver bullet thing for parallelism and for concurrency and scheduling takes us to talking about measurement so it's always important to remember the import uh, how measurement is important and we have great tools to measure uh, in the lab so we have the profiler components that uh, it's a page that's been out there for a while now and very few people are using. Uh, we have Why Did You Render? That's a really, really interesting library that allows you to spot wasted re-renders and that you can use uh, combined with the profiler. And uh, we have Lighthouse and other tools like how Lighthouse that kind of allows you to check uh, metrics, all of those uh, metrics from Core Web Vitals. Also, uh, we should always measure in the field because it's the only way to know how our, how our apps are actually working to our users. So we have tools like Caliber and Speed Curve to do like, like observability tools for performance. We have libraries like Web Vitals that uh, they, it even comes out of the box and create React App, for example, and it allows you to track uh, metrics like uh, first input delay, largest contentful paint, and so on. And if you're using platforms like Verso, uh, you even have Verso analytics out of the box. So I also think it's important not to forget that, uh, yeah, we do have observability tools and uh, we do have libraries, but uh, in the end, let's always remember that we have the web as a platform. So nowadays we have a lot of 
APIs for timing, we have user timing, we have event timing. Event time, by the way, is the basis for the first input delay metric that we see the tools generating. Uh, we have element timing to, to measure the largest content full paint. And we also have a lot of profiling uh, APIs in the browser. So we have long tasks API. That is how under the hood those tools, they measure your long tasks. Uh, we have the self-profiling API that you can use exactly to, sp to spot uh, bad parts of your code that are causing long tasks. And you have user agent specific memory to debug memory leaks in your app. And uh, when we see the, what these APIs can give us, it's a lot of metadata about our code, about how it's consuming process power, how it's consuming memory, and uh, how it's affecting the experience. Uh, one last thing is the future. And uh, I, I, I'm so hyped with everything I've talked uh, so far. And I think that the future is even brighter. There are a lot of amazing stuff coming down the line. So we're going to have I.O. libraries like, Rea uh, like React Fetch. I know it's been promised for a while now, but it, it, some t at some point it's going to be there. Um, we're going to have the cache uh, components to allow data fetching libraries to properly integrate with Suspense to have like better integration. Uh, we, this is one of my favorite ones. We're going to have Suspense for CPU bound trees. So that's kind of like uh, you, uh, you check your code and you know which operations are going to be really heavy. So you just add one extra pop in Suspense and that's going to fall back immediately without even trying to render that CPU bound tree. And then it's going to render fallback, and then it goes after rendering that. Uh, there's going to be also more hooks for library maintainers like user insertion, in fact. Uh, the off-screen component, which is a declarative way of assigning like idle priority to some part of your tree. Uh, server components, uh, which don't need further explanation. Uh, they are amazing. And the web is also, there's a lot of things. The APIs I mentioned, uh, some of them are still being specced like they used. So we're going to have a lot of native scheduling primitives in the browser. And that's going to be amazing. And much more. Seriously, we could have like tons of different talks about each of those topics. And uh, it wouldn't be enough. So uh, moving to a couple of closing notes. Uh, I guess the first one would be, uh, we can clearly see that React has been pushing web apps to the future, web APIs to the future. So this is the example for the scheduling API. And the is input pending part of the API, for example, it was drafted by Facebook. And uh, a lot of the requirements are, in, are aligned with the core team. And we have other examples, for example, uh, like uh, effect handlers, uh, algebraic effect handlers in JavaScript. The discussions for having that started like five or six years ago when one of the core team members of React uh, wanted to have them in the language. Another thing we can see is that the framework tries to address the lack of some features in JavaScript as a language, but also in the browser as a platform. Uh, with their own solutions. So for example, when uh, we, see, we saw this morning, like uh, we were throwing a promise, uh, this sounds like a hacky solution, et cetera, but that's an oversimplified way of describing Suspense. But actually, uh, what Suspense is trying to do is to do uh, effect handlers in a language that doesn't have effect handlers in continuation. And the same thing with the scheduler API. So React is building a scheduler probably because the browser doesn't have a proper one. And it leads to thinking that understanding these internals uh, and the motivations behind them helps a lot, uh, us, helps us bringing our own abstractions on top of that, like the scheduler we drafted in 40 lines of code based on generators. Uh, it is important to emphasize that scheduling, by definition, does not necessarily mean a better performance. And just like that, there's no silver bullet. So it's really important that you identify w your core metrics and uh, use the observability service, the libraries, and the web APIs to actually figure out what's working for you. And um, there's a lot of information out there. So you're going to see, especially on Twitter, GitHub, and et cetera, different members of the communities making really good points about each of those libraries as well, the solid, React, et cetera. 
Uh, and those are all really good points. So it's important that for us to always correlate uh, the business metrics with performance because there's no way to game business metrics so that we can post on Twitter that they're cool because these are what actually are, are making uh, results for our clients. So measure and correlate that. Uh, it, it is a closing thought, not related though. Uh, I work with Medallia and we are hiring in a lot of countries, including here in India. And if you're interested, just reach out to me. Uh, I do have a couple of stickers, as I said in the beginning. And I have the results for the thing, so if you think you might be the first one, uh, let's chat. Uh, the slides for this session are going to be available on my speaker deck. Uh, take, uh, it's not published yet, but by the end of the day, it is going to be. And there are slides. Oops. <laughs> um, yeah, feel free to take a picture. But uh, this is the one go to link. You're going to find the slides for this session. Uh, you're going to find other sessions about internals of React, the performance optimization, etc., as well as info for Medallia. That's all I had for today. Thank you so much for having me, and it's great to be here.